This episode of The Dark Side of the Rainbow is sponsored by us. We wanted to let you know that we have a huge online store full of official, you gotta get the official, Gays Against Groomers merch. Each purchase really helps us continue our fight, and it's also a great way to spread an important message. So check it out at shop.gazeagainstgroomers.com. That's shop.gazeagainstgroomers.com. And to learn more about our organization, donate to our cause, or get involved, just visit gazeagainstgroomers.com. And if you're interested in sponsoring this, please reach out at podcast at gazeagainstgroomers.com. Welcome to the Dark Side of the Rainbow. This is Robert Wallace, and today we have Mia Hughes. Mia is the author of the WPATH Files, and she's joining us today to discuss the revelations and the impact that that report has made. How are you doing today, Mia? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being had. <laughs> so. Let me ask you, I was listening to one of your other interviews and you mentioned something that I don't think gets repeated or said enough, and that's regarding the dangers of HRT or hormone replacement therapy and how deadly it can be. I was wondering, what kind of findings do you have on that or, or what have you discovered that brought you to that? Right. So there was a... First of all, the report that I wrote was based upon leaked internal communications from the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And so this is from an in internal messaging forum. It's called Doc Matter, and it's where medical professionals are supposed to congregate and discuss patients and improve patient outcome. And that's not what ha happens on WPATH's forum. And so one of the leaked conversations that we had, and it's a very short conversation, it was about a, I think it was a 16-year-old girl who was on testosterone, and she had developed large liver masses. Now, they, they were not, it was not clear if it was malignant or benign, but her oncologist thought that the, the offending agents were the hormones. And so it's a doctor who posts about this 16-year-old girl. And then another WPATH doctor, also a family physician, shows up with a little anecdote. And she says, oh, I had a, a trans-identified colleague who, after several years on testosterone, developed liver cancer and died. And her oncologist, well, they would use different pronouns, but her oncologist also put it down to the testosterone. And then that was the end of the conversation. This is, you know, you, to me, that's a red flag in and of itself is the fact that it, that was the end of the conversation. Nobody had like this, oh my goodness, we really need to look into this. What if we, testosterone is causing liver cancer in all of these young patients? We don't know because this is brand new. We have never given testosterone to females on you know a grand scale before this has never been mainstream medical practice so we have no long term data so when i was writing the report i included obviously this anecdote as one of the side effects of testosterone in natal females and i looked and i found there was another case study of and this was also a teenage girl it was published in the lancet and another teenage girl on testosterone who had also developed liver cancer. I, we don't know the outcome for the girl, but I assume it's probably, it wasn't very good. And then again, they were concerned that the, the, the reason was the testosterone. And then there was somebody tried to do, because of that unusual case and because of another unusual case, they tried to look at, do a systematic review of the literature to see if they could find a pattern. 
And they, but they, the conclusion was they couldn't because, as I just said, this is brand new territory. We've never done this before. We have no idea what the long term outcome is for these girls, but we do know that testosterone is carcinogenic. We do know that we know from from the East German doping scandals when when female athletes were given an anabolic steroid which was derived from testosterone many of them developed liver cancer many of them developed reproductive cancer so we know that there is there's a risk and yet still we're dishing it out at planned parenthood after a 1 hour appointment where these girls fill in a form so yeah it's something we're not talking about that we really should be wow yeah, I haven't heard that connection made between the testosterone and the for the HRT for the trans males. That's what they would be considered. And yet that is part of the diet, the dietary recommendation for those who are recommended to go down this path. Another thing that I like that you said was that you know, this really is a psychosomatic condition at its root, which is to say that it is rooted in the thinking process and in a psychological phase. So could you elaborate on that? I could. This is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. So we have got, if you look at these young, that we've got what is obviously a psychiatric epidemic or a social contagion of what we now call gender dysphoria. We can see that because the numbers, there was, you know, exponential growth, mostly adolescent females, when historically it would have been young boys and middle-aged men. And so we can see that there's a psychiatric epidemic going on. And then We've we've been here before, okay? We've had plenty of these before. We've had, you know, psychiatric epidemics of eating disorders, bulimia, anorexia, multiple personality disorder, hysteria back in the 19th century. So what you've there, there's a type of mental illness that is it's it's socially contagious, and that is partly because it's not well, I'm going to say it's not real. The field of psychiatry creates mental illnesses. It depends, you know, these things evolve with the culture, or the cultural whims and the fads of the era create their own psychiatric disorders and they come and they go. And the people, the, the, those who find themselves in distress, we are just talking unhappy people. Throughout history, there have always been unhappy people, people who are struggling, people who, for whatever reason, they are not doing very well in life and they do not feel good about themselves. And every unhappy person in their time and in their place since the invention of psychiatry, they have had a symptom pool. They've had a pool of recognized psychiatric disorders that they can select from, okay? If you were alive in the late eight, late 19th century and you were an unhappy woman, you could select hysteria from your symptom pool. If you were alive in the 1980s and you were an unhappy woman, you could select multiple personality disorder from the symptom pool. And the symptom pool is always changing. But when a woman, well, well, no, when someone, an unhappy person, is either given a diagnosis or gives themselves a diagnosis, then they become that diagnosis. They, they, they absorb the diagnosis, they imbibe the narrative of their time, and then they start to manifest the symptoms. So a psychosomatic symptom, it can just be for for these girls right now at this time and in this place, they have got gender dysphoria to select from the symptom pool. They're looking at their lives. They hate their body. They're miserable. They don't fit in with people. They they're they're not doing very well in life, and they they just select gender dysphoria from the symptom pool. And along with that comes the psychosomatic symptom that you know, this hatred of their secondary sex characteristics. So they'll they'll sort of imbibe the narrative of 
the tr- the modern trans rights movement that tells them if they are unhappy, that means they're a member of the opposite sex. And then they'll fixate on their secondary sex characteristics as the source of their distress and then fixate on having them removed. So they want to have their healthy breasts removed because they're convinced that that's what's going to make them happy. They'll they'll fixate on, you know, they, they'll want testosterone because they fixated on the fact that they need to look like a man in order to be happy, or they, well, they actually believe themselves to be men. And I, in my report, one of the things that I, the part that I enjoyed writing the most, I have to say, is Towards the end, I I take four case studies of historical medical scandals and compare them to the one that we've got going now. And there's one which was ovariotomy in the 19th century, and it was the biggest medical scandal of the 19th century. And this was when surgeons were removing healthy ovaries as a cure for mental distress in women. And Again, it was it, this was based on something called reflex theory, which was the idea that one organ in the body could create symptoms in a distant organ in the body. Completely pseudoscientific. There's no truth to it whatsoever. And so then what was happening was women of the time who were unhappy, they were depressed, they were miserable, they were imbibing the narrative of reflex theory, and then they were fixating on their healthy ovaries as the source of their mental distress. And then they would show up and ask surgeons to remove their healthy ovaries. And then many of them after the fact would say, that they felt a lot better if they didn't die. 30% of them died because we're talking a time before antibiotics and, and surgical cleanliness. But if they didn't die, many of them were convinced that they were cured by having their perfectly healthy ovaries removed. That, again, is the power of the mind, right? That's placebo. If, if you tell yourself something is going to make you feel better and then you go through a very... Oh, very awful, brutal surgery, at the end of it, you're going to be very motivated for it to have been the right decision and to tell yourself that, yes, you actually do feel better. And it's the same thing as now. These young girls, they're just, they're fixating on body parts that have nothing to do with their mental distress whatsoever. They get, you know, their breasts removed. Sometimes they get their ovaries removed too. And then after the fact, again, they tell themselves that it cured them and that they and that they feel better but again it, it's it's not it's as it's as pseudo scientific as reflex theory was in the 19th century this is not the source of their problems but they've just they they're so influenced by the messaging of the modern trans rights movement and the cultural climate in which they are growing up yeah Absolutely. What role would you say that autism plays in this? We know that uh, a great majority of the trans identifying patients are found somewhere on the spectrum of autism. A lot of times in social media, they're loud and proud about their mental health illness condition. And obviously being in that state both makes you vulnerable and brings your decision and and judgment making abilities brings that into question. What do you find with those regards? Yeah, there are a number of reasons why kids on the, on the spectrum might be, would, would be more at risk for this. One, I think it's quite tragic really, when you think about it is like I just said, it's the it's the unhappy kids. It's the unhappy people who are getting sucked into this. So if a young person is on the spectrum or has a diagnosis of autism, they likely are struggling socially. That's one of the the symptoms of being autistic is you struggle to bond with your peers. And these poor kids, you know, they, they don't really understand why they don't fit in. They don't understand why other kids don't like them. And they as well, they desperately want to fit in. They want to make connections. They want to make friends. And so part of it is just that, that this, it, this, it, it preys on the vulnerable. That's the, it's the vulnerable kids. It's the kids who are struggling, who get sucked into this. Because if they, if you put into Google, 
am I trans? You know, you put in, put that in. If an autistic kid puts that in, am I trans? And then a whole list, you know, do you hate your body? Do you, do you struggle to fit in with your peers? Do you have no friends? These are all symptoms of being trans, according to Google. So of course, the autistic kids, just because of their social difficulties, they're going to be more attracted or they're going to be more likely to self-diagnose and believe themselves to be trans. And then there's another really troubling, distressing part that I find is when they come out as trans or they see other socially awkward, difficult, quirky kids coming out as trans, and then suddenly they're very popular. You know, it's you get love bombed, you get, you know, all the likes and the comments on social media, and suddenly the kid is very popular in a certain circle. And it's like they find their tribe. This kid who's been isolated, who's had a really hard time and has never really been able to make friends, coming out as trans gives them their tribe. It gives them this group of people who are accepting and celebrating them. But the trouble is they're celebrating a version of them that's not real. They're celebrating the trans identity. And we all know what happens if you if you desist or detransition or whatever, you are out, you're gone. So then there's a there's a really strong motivation to stay identifying as trans. And that comes with the risk of hormonal and surgical interventions. That comes at the cost of future fertility it comes at the cost of the future chance of intimacy can even be comes at the cost of body parts so there's the there's the social side of it and then i think there are just particular autistic traits that make the autistic child more at risk and one of them is very much this rigid thinking this this black and white thinking so like blue for boys, pink for girls. If I'm a boy who likes pink, it makes sense that I'm a girl because girls like pink. You know, there's a very rigid black and white way of thinking. Autistic kids can really struggle to express how they're feeling, to describe how they're feeling. And I think if they're just being bombarded with the wrong messaging, if you think about the type of messaging that they're receiving in schools, they they're being told that if they like certain things that could be that they're trans they're being told that it's possible to be a boy with a girl brain it's possible to be a girl with a boy brain this this insane messaging none of which is based even remotely in fact can just untether the vulnerable autistic child when they really need what they need is grounding in reality and they and they need more time to grow up as well like the autistic adolescent is going to struggle much more with their developing sexual body and again because they're struggling and then one of the symptoms of being transgender is hatred of your secondary sex characteristics of course, again, they're going to be more at risk because they will be very uncomfortable in their in their bodies while they're changing so much. I mean, to be honest, though, straying from autism, basically every single adolescent could diagnose themselves as being transgender, right? What what kid going through puberty loves their sec secondary sex characteristics? What what kid is comfortable with their developing body? So really every kid is at risk, but yeah, the autistic ones are very at risk. Yeah, they are. And I know myself, just with the pressures of trying to fit in as a youth and then also finding myself to be quite gay on the side, but then not liking that about myself somewhat for spiritual reasons and somewhat just for the, the growing pains of moving into society and having to reintroduce yourself to the world and be known with this attached to you had the whole LGBTQ, Q, I, A, A plus thing, menu been an option, I think that would have been really detrimental for me because even at one point I did identify as asexual even before that whole thing was in a, and that was just a way for me to like ignore all sexuality to kind of, you know, I'm just like this angelic being who's transcended sexuality and I just don't see it. And, but had that 80 varietals of queerism have been available. Maybe I would have just, you know, 
flown one of those banners and then called it a day. So yeah, it's definitely a social contagion that's influencing susceptible minds. I mean, as well, the the future homosexual adults, the kids who would otherwise grow up to be gay are some of the most at risk, right? Because extreme gender nonconformity in, in childhood is a very strong indicator of future homosexuality. And yet one of the symptoms of childhood onset gender dysphoria, one of the signs of a trans kid is extreme gender nonconformity. It's extreme gender nonconforming behavior. We all we always cut point to Jazz Jennings, the the you know we have a whole reality TV show documenting the 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 abuse of Jazz Jennings. But yeah, the 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 kids who would otherwise grow up to be gay are some of the ones who are most at risk. Yeah. They definitely are. So in conjunction with the autism with the confusion of the gay thing and then you've got the other mental disorders that could come from or be supplemented by drugs medicine either medicines causing other side effects or because of their situation they're taking these medicines which could then interact negatively with their procedures what kind of things did you find in your reporting that maybe you looked like a negligence and overlooking some of those uh, pre-existing factors. In so in the WPATH files, what what is glaringly obvious is that no one inside WPATH cares about how the the transgender identity has formed. Basically, they the starting point for these people is if a person says they are trans then they are trans and then you go from there if they wish to have hormones and surgeries then they should have them because that's it's their human right it's basically a human right so there was absolutely no interest and no curiosity into what could have led to the formation of this identity because for them of course i understand why and it's because to them, gender dysphoria, gender identity, gender incongruence, whatever you want to call it, it's not a mental illness. So it's a perfectly natural, healthy state of being that just so happens to require hormones and surgeries. So they're not they're not really interested in how it formed because it's not an illness, it's something to celebrate. And so time and time again in the files, you see just like very complex cases these are these are people who have very complex mental health profiles being allowed to consent to hormones or surgery there'll be people with you know dissociative identity disorder i mean we could i could go off on a tangent about that cuz i really i like the multiple personality disorder epidemic but it's back and it's dissociative identity disorder and it has met the modern trans rights movement. It has met the gender medicine movement. And so you've got someone in there saying, you know, if somebody has dissociative identity disorder, which means they they think that they have multiple distinct personalities living within their body, if somebody has this, they're called alters, then you've got to make sure that you get consent from all of the alters before they start hormones Otherwise, you could be sued later because you haven't really gained true informed consent. You know, absolutely bonkers, just just totally mad. Make sure that because like if somebody's got, you know, if they're if they're in a male body and they want to transition to female using estrogen, well, you've got to make sure that all of the male alters and the female alters agree to the hormones. Just madness. Like instead of deep psychotherapeutic work to figure out what's going on. Because with this dissociative identity disorder, there's often trauma in the background. The person is dissociating for a reason. There's usually trauma. And again, there's there's there are people in there with PTSD. There are people in there with major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar. And Every single time somebody comes along with this really complicated case and says, I'm not really sure what to do with this patient, the chorus of people who come along basically say, I don't see why why you would 
I don't know why you would deny this person hormones. I don't know why you're perplexed. And and they encourage medical transition. It's it's basically a forum where they're all egging each other on. And I should point out that. I'm not really well. I've spoken to medical professionals since and while I was writing the report to to find out how how do doctors talk in private? Maybe this is how doctors engage when when they're discussing patients, but it's not. It's apparently not at all. And the reason I think the WPATH files are so interesting and what makes WPATH itself a very interesting organization is it's a hybrid organization in that there are surgeons, endocrinologists, family doctors, medical professionals, and then your mental health professionals. You've got psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, and they're all in there talking about patients. But as well, you've got a strong cohort and rather vocal cohort of trans activists, non-medical people, the human rights lawyers, and the and the the well, basically they just seem to be transgender people who have an interest in gender medicine, anyone can join and then anyone can participate in these conversations. So of course you've got like, I don't think doctors can really talk properly amongst themselves when they've got very extreme trans activists in there who are almost fanatic about, well, no, they are not almost, they are fanatic about the, the transition as a human right hormones and surgeries it's a human right and and if you if you show caution then then that's bigotry that's discrimination um gatekeeping or what we would call safeguarding also transphobic we don't want any gatekeeping it's it's hormones and surgeries for everyone and because these activists are in there mixed in with surgeons and, and endocrinologists, you just have this culture of everybody egging each other on, no matter how complex the mental health profile is. Or, or there's even there's one where a, a Yale, uh, she's at Yale University Med School, and she shows up, and she's a practicing physician as well, and she shows up, and she's got a 13 year old developmentally delayed kid who has already been on puberty blockers for about two years. And the the professor, the, the physician is, is like, I'm not really sure when or if ever this kid will reach a developmentally appropriate stage to consent to hormones. And again, along come a whole bunch of people just saying, oh yeah, it's fine. Let the, let the kid have hormones. There's no one for whom hormones and surgeries are inappropriate, it would seem. Yeah. Wow. When you're talking in terms of taking and allowing kids, like you said, that probably have anything from they're on the autism spectrum, they probably have multiple personality disorders of some kind. They probably have some other mental illness and they're probably in drugs for all of it. And yet they're being allowed to consent to operations operations which you know to which like getting a tattoo on your back like pales in comparison because you're literally removing appendages or, or altering the location of things in your body and you can't question any of that then like you said you have this clicky little culty area of the medical industry where you've got activists blended with mad scientist types and <laughs> Somewhere in the midst, we are supposed to be filtering out kids who shouldn't be there, which there's just no protocol for that. That's what I'm gathering. And so in, in some of the things that I've seen in the WPATH files and that you've talked about, we see physicians who are actively concerned about the state of their patients and and sometimes it even seems like they're concerned themselves, but they still are proceeding forward and disregarding certain of these things because it's protocol, because the culture of like you're, you're talking about gender affirming, the gender affirming model. What kind of lawsuits do you think will eventually be opened up because of this sort of negligence? 
The lawsuits will be legion. There's no question about it. It's we're still in the early stages. I think we're I think we're probably at the beginning of the end of this medical scandal. So part of how I helped myself understand what we're seeing today was to turn to medical history and to look at times in the past when doctors did terrible things, thinking that they were helping. I mean, in almost every medical scandal that has occurred throughout history, throughout medical history, the doctors always thought they were helping their patients. They were very misguided and they they behaved recklessly without any evidence to show that what they were doing was safe. And then the scandal ended in some way. And so lawsuits I think, well, there's no question, there can be no question that we're facing malpractice lawsuits. It's going to be, I don't know if it's as simple as everyone thinks. It's very difficult to win a malpractice case. And so we're going to have to, the the very difficult part of it is that an individual doctor, if they are sued for malpractice, they can just say, I was following W path. They can just say, well, the the World Professional Association for Transgender Health said that this treatment protocol was safe and that it was age it was appropriate for these young patients and I just did what they said. And so to to me in my mind, I don't I I'm I'm not a legal person so I don't understand, but I really I don't know why we don't have a lawsuit against WPATH itself because WPATH fraudulently created standards of care, basically. They, they, if you look at their standards of care, we're in the version eight and it was published in 2022. It's one hefty document. And on the surface, it looks legitimate. It, you, you can see why people, well, actually, no, for the standards of care eight, actually, I can't see how people were fooled because that's the one with the infamous eunuch chapter. You know, this is a this is a supposedly world-leading respectable healthcare group that included an entire chapter on eunuch as a valid gender identity deserving of hormonal and surgical castration. So, in Standards of Care 8, there was a very clear red flag, do not trust this organization. And yet still, all across North America, health authorities, gender clinics, trust the eunuch people. But you can understand in the other chapters how it looks like real science, because you can have a whole chapter with hundreds of citations, scientific literature to back up every statement that they're making. And it's only when you go in and you check the citations that you realize, goodness me, it's all garbage junk science. There's no actual real science here whatsoever. There are no controlled studies. There are there are no long there's no long term follow up. There's nothing that resembles, you know, real science. It's all just these silly like no follow up, or they've lost seventy percent of the patients, or self report. Everyone's like, oh yeah, I feel great afterwards, and it's not real science at all. So in my mind, somebody has got to go after WPATH. Like they've gone after, there's a lawsuit in Rhode Island. It's a detransitioner. She was treated horrendously. And the lawyers have also named the American Academy of Pediatrics in the lawsuit because the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2018 produced an absolutely junk position statement endorsing gender affirming care absolutely devoid of any science misrepresenting entire bodies of literature that were done on adult sexuality and then they just applied it to kids with supposed gender identi- mismatched gender identities so the 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 American Academy of Pediatrics is already named in a lawsuit and i think wpath ought to be as well because they made very strong recommendations for a treatment protocol that is irreversible, extremely brutal, almost it's as harsh as cancer treatment. They they strongly recommended that kids be placed onto this pathway while at the same time knowing that they had no science whatsoever to back it up. It, I think on a long enough timeline, and also here's the other thing that I think everyone needs to do, 
and some states have done it. I really should look up which ones. But this increasing the statute of limitations, one of the reasons we don't have very many detrans lawsuits is because certain in most places, the statute of limitations is two years. So you've only got two years to file. If a doctor harms you in some way, you've only got two years to file the lawsuit. Detransition can take, you know, on average, eight to 10 years. So Two states have done it already, I think, where they've opened up the statute of limitations to 30 years after the young person turns 18. And I think for all gender affirming care, so-called, that's not even just for minors, that should be the case for all gender medicine, be they an adult, a minor, whatever. Open it up so you've got, instead of two years, you've got 30 years to sue. And then if these gender doctors are so confident that nobody regrets their decision and they are only transitioning the people for whom medical transition is the right the right approach, they've got nothing at all to worry about. And of course, they really that's that they, they have an awful lot to worry about because I think I predict that most of these young people transitioning in this social contagion will on a long enough timeline detransition because not one of them, well, not one of them is really trans. Wow. So, you know, you said several interesting things there and, and I just want to get back to one of the last things that you had said, you know, if we did, for instance, have a policy or a law where it was possible for a patient to sue a doctor 30 years after they'd become 18, with regards to the malpractice of the whole gender transformation thing shouldn't have happened. It kind of makes me think, you know, go to think about the crux of the whole issue. Cause if you think about like a person who goes to get a tattoo and then they look at that tattoo a year, two years or 30 years later, and they're like, ah, I shouldn't have gotten this tattoo. They can't go back to the tattoo artist and complain because they chose what they chose. But the interesting thing here is we have patients who are A, under 18, which generally you don't have with tattoos, and B, not only are they not giving informed consent, they are not because they can't. And I understand part of that is they can't simply because the whole promise of just changing genders is impossible to begin with. So it seems like, you know, with a policy like that, every doctor would be just a sitting duck for the mood swing of of a patient. And since that's the only thing they have to go by, since they can't really diagnose it except through this confession, is it ever safe for a doctor to do this sort of thing then? Now, I, I'm definitely, I skew more on the extreme on this, on this question. Because I I do not think that this is medicine. Okay, so if you look at the history of gender medicine, it's always been very dubious. It started, you know, the first attempt at sex reassignment was in 1906. And then very, you know, a, a whole lot of very dubious experimentation. Never any solid science never any randomized control trials never never any long term follow up never any proof that this is a safe effective beneficial medical treatment and certainly for me when i think medicine i think first do no harm so i think doctors are tasked with healing and alleviating suffering. Now, of course, that's where this comes in. These these gender medicine doctors will say they are alleviating suffering, the suffering of the, the gender dysphoric person. But to me, the the surgeries, well, first and foremost, they take a perfectly healthy functioning endocrine system and they destroy it. Okay. It's not nothing to with puberty blockers to just shut down the whole endocrine system the way that they do. That's not nothing. It's not nothing to prescribe large doses of wrong sex hormones. The female body is not designed for large doses of testosterone. The male body is not designed for large quantities of estrogen. 
And again, we have no long-term studies to say that this is safe. And we do have some studies to show that actually it's not very safe at all. There are there are very detrimental effects to the health. This is this is called iatrogenesis, like the treatment causes illness, and that's what we're doing. We're taking healthy, functioning bodily systems and we're destroying them. And then on to the surgeries. You know, the the taking inverting a man's penis, creating an open, creating a wound that must be dilated for life that comes with a very high complication rate and again impacts his entire health you know you 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 castrate a man and you invert his penis that's going to have wide ranging repercussions on that man's health for the rest of his life i don't even like i i'm almost lost for words at what they're doing to women the women who undergo the phalloplasty you know I cannot believe that phalloplasty is legal, to be honest. This is where the, the surgeon will strip the, the skin, harvest the skin of a woman's forearm, and then fashion it into something resembling a penis and sew it onto her groin. Astronomical complication rates. And honestly, how does that help? How does that help a, a mentally ill woman who is obviously not in a good place in life, how is it going to help her to have an appendage made out of her forearm sewn onto her groin? So I find myself in the place where I simply don't believe it's medicine because medicine doesn't destroy health. I think it looks like medicine. It uses the tools and the techniques of medicine but for the purpose of destroying healthy bodies. And we do not have any good quality science to show that the outcome for these people, that it resolves their gender distress. We simply don't have it. We have a whole lot of really bad studies where they ask transgender people, are you happy? And all the happy ones say, yes, I'm happy. And then they say, okay, well then this must be a really good medical treatment. But we don't have what you need is the real long term follow up. Follow, don't lose any of the patients. Follow up 100% of them and find out what became of them. And only then will we know if it's beneficial and if it's helping the people resolve their gender related distress, which is supposedly the whole point. I'm not convinced that it is. And then there's another layer to it, and that is. I talk about it in the report, how self-report in this field of medicine or any field of medicine really, but in this field particularly, self-report is not, ac it's not an accurate way to assess whether the treatment was appropriate or beneficial or not. Because these, imagine you are one of these people, imagine you are someone who has made the decision to undergo vaginoplasty, you've had your penis inverted, you're on estrogen, and you made that decision because you were absolutely convinced that it was going to make you happy. And so you get to the end of it, even if it hasn't made you happy, you are going to be very psychologically motivated to tell yourself every single day that you are happy and that you made the right decision. Because Imagine otherwise, imagine having to face up, detransitioners will tell you how hard that moment was of facing up to the fact that they they made a mistake. And then you realize what you've done to your body. You realize everything that you've sacrificed. So there's like we know this from other studies. The more you put into something, the more difficult it is to ac achieve something or to acquire something, the more likely you are that you will tell yourself it was the right decision. It's, the, it's, it's basic psychology. And so these people have paid the ultimate, well, they, they've paid an enormous price. They've put in so much. I don't think asking them at the end of it, are you happy, is a scientific method of measuring whether this is an appropriate treatment or not. I'm not sure if I answered your question. I think I've actually forgotten what the question was. No. Yeah. Well, my question was related to whether or not it was ever really, I think, appropriate for a doctor to 
to do these things since there's really no conditions under which a, a child can give any kind of consent, let alone informed consent. Well, I mean, okay, for a child, absolutely not. Never, ever, ever. No no child that we need to get rid of all child transition. And and I mean that in in social transition, puberty blockers, hormones, and surgeries. Absolutely all of that can must be banned and it will be. We're getting to the end of that part of the scandal. But where I'm a little bit more extreme, I think, is when it when it applies to adults as well, this is not medicine. I'm not saying we should ban it. I'm just saying it's not medicine. And, you know, plenty of people were happy with the results of their loved one's lobotomy, right? Like families who made the decision to get their loved one lobotomized, and then they're looking after a permanently disabled person who is in a childlike state of dependency, the family were often, you know, they would report being happy w- with the fact that they'd had their loved one lobotomized because they couldn't look at the mistake that they'd made. They couldn't m- admit to themselves that they'd made a mistake. And so just because some people are happy, it doesn't mean this is real medical care that we should be offering. But we are in this situation where some people think that it is the only thing that will make them happy. So I don't I don't actually advocate for a total ban. I just think one day it's probably going to end up alongside lobotomies as one of those terrible medical misadventures that we never should have allowed to happen. Absolutely. You know, one of the primary focuses of Gays Against Groomers is particularly with regards to how children are affected by the trans propaganda, the queer ideology, all of that. And even for adults, you know, one of our members and former chapter lead here in Arizona, who now has a film that's coming out called Leaving Amy, Matt Ray was 28 years old when she, or I think it was actually 25 when she became he. And now at the age of 32, Matt's a year into trying to detransition, something that is not really going to be possible. Like the physical appearance and all of this stuff is permanent, even if Matt understands Matt self to be Amy, you know, so there is that whole, you can't go back. And even an adult can make that decision, that, that wrong decision. And so how much easier is it for kids? So it's just kind of tremendous because, you know, at the level of what you're talking about, it affects really so many uh, adult particular in particular. And it, with as bad as it is, it's just so much worse for kids. It's hard, hard to even think about, but that it's a growing trend. And so, yeah, it would be amazing to see that end for some sort of common sense regulation to come in and say, like you said, this isn't medicine. It's not, it's not medicine. It's not even, I was taught when I was talking to Dr. Eitan Heim a few episodes back, that's also one of the things that he said, it's not like cosmetic surgery where you were altering the nose to look like a different nose. You're completely removing a body part and putting the substitute alternative thing there. So this really is turned into a freak show of sorts. It's turned in, you know, when you look at all of the terrible things that come out of botched up surgeries and, and the way people really come out looking because their mental health and everything, what other kind of things would you hope would change? You know, let's say there is a major lawsuit against WPATH and and all of a sudden the rules change, there's regulations now. What would be some of the major regulations that you think would be put into place if WPATH weren't running the show? I think if WPATH were, I mean, to be honest, they don't have to be sued out of existence, although that would be wonderful. They just, they need to be thoroughly discredited and nobody, nobody should be listening to them. And I think once the medical world rids itself of the influence of WPATH, it can go back to evidence-based medicine. It can go back to respecting the scientific process, basing its recommendations on real evidence, not just this ideologically driven movement that really has no respect whatsoever for the scientific process. 
and and evidence. They they just don't care about it at all. So I think without without WPATH, there could be this shift back to the first thing that has to happen is gender. I, I, I struggle to even know what to call it. We've got gender dysphoria and we've got gender incongruence are the two diagnoses at, the, at this point, but they're just nonsense diagnoses anyway. Gender identity disorder was probably the best one. Whatever you want to call it, let's take it back to being a psychiatric disorder, which it clearly is. Okay. WPATH were front and center in convincing the American Psychiatric Association to redefine gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria so that that makes the gender, the mismatched gender identity is not a psychiatric condition. So if you can shift it back the other way, if the medical world can just get rid of WPATH, forget about their recommendations and go back to looking at gender identity disorder or whatever as a psychiatric disorder in need of mental health support. The aim of treatment should always be to help the person reconcile with the reality of their body. WPATH's influence made it that doing that, trying to help the person overcome their gender dysphoria, that's conversion therapy. That's you know, that's that's the equivalent of gay conversion therapy, which is madness, of course. Taking it back to the aim should always be to avert the need for lifelong medical intervention. The 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 doctors should always be least invasive first, focusing on mental health care and trying to do everything that they can to avert the need for hormones and surgeries. There's I really like I talk about this in the report in the year in the 2000s there was a c- consultant psychiatrist called Dr Az Hakim at the Portman Clinic in London which is the adult part of attached to the Tavistock we all know the Tavistock the the infamous youth gender service that has been the center of much controversy and is now closed down so as was in the Portman Clinic And I think he hit on the solution that we need to now, if we can abandon WPATH and we can abandon this gender affirming model of care and we can go into a softer landing, we don't need to ban this whole medical experiment, but just a softer landing would be what As did at the Portman. And that is he, he, when he first got there, he had two groups of people. He had People at the beginning of the transition, they they desired medical transition and they were really euphoric that this was going to be the answer. It would solve all of their problems. Hormones and surgeries would solve all of their problems. And then he had another group of people and they were the post-op regretters. And he said that they were basically, it was just abject misery and despair because they had gone, they, they their fantasy remedy, their fantasy solution had not quite lived up to the fantasy and they realized that they'd made a terrible mistake. And what he did is he put the two groups together and he found that those who were wanting to transition, 98% of them did not ultimately transition because he brought them face to face with the truth, the reality, rather than the fantasy. And that's part of the problem, I think, is no one's ever allowed to talk about the terrible side effects. Detransitioners are silenced. Anyone who has a bad outcome, well, it's just don't talk about it because you don't want to be transphobic and put people off. But bringing them face to face, letting them have realistic expectations, let them, these people wanting to transition we still have to offer it because we've we let the genie out of the bottle and there are people who really do think that it is going to save their life but bring them face to face with the reality of what medical transition can and cannot do and then i think you'll find that the vast majority would not choose to go down that medical pathway i think that's where we can go if we can get rid of the w path fanatic, ideologically driven style of medicine that nobody's allowed to talk about the downside at all. It's all like a fantasy. 
You know, exactly. And a question I want to ask you ties in directly with that. I just wanted to real quick mention that you're going to be participating in leaving Amy. Isn't that right? That's right. Uh, Okay. So I just talked to Matt and Jude, and then they mentioned that. I kind of just forgot about it until just now. So that film, leavingamy.com, is where the trailer's at. Mia is going to be in that, and she's going to be amazing. So look forward to that. What I want to ask you about is kind of broad in general, but it ties in with this. And in a word, subversion of language. We have definitions changing left and right. Words you're allowed to say and words you cannot say. How do you think the control of language is really controlling how all of this is playing out right now? I think it's very, I think when we were forbidden from naming reality, that's that's when all of this really, that's when all of this madness plunged to new depths. So I think if we had always been allowed to speak freely, to call men men and to call women women, and to to describe these surgeries as for what they are rather than the euphemistic, you know, the top surgery and the bottom surgery and all the rest of it, I think we would not be in this mess. So it's certainly the attack on free speech and the the control of our language and the you know the viciousness with which all of your you know the my the most minor of indiscretions would be viciously punished by trans rights activists anyone dare you know use the wrong pronouns they'll get attacked or if they they call a, a man a man they'll get attacked it's it created a climate of fear in which no one dared to stand up for these kids. So we, we, so many people were, they, I, I, I think a lot of people saw what was happening and just were too afraid to say anything. And I think maybe there's a wider circle of people who, because of the control of language, because Everybody was afraid to name reality. Everybody was afraid to really talk about what was happening. There's a much wider circle of people who simply didn't know that this was happening. So this is a medical scandal that has been unfolding in plain view of the world for, you know, over a decade. And those the the like those of us who could see it happening have been trying to raise the alarm. The The control of speech has meant that an awful lot of people were too afraid to say anything, people in the medical world, people in education, because it's really crucial to understand how central the the role of schools is in this medical scandal. Like all of this nonsense, all of these bad ideas, these dangerous ideas are being thrust upon kids in school. And then teachers, they're afraid to say something because they have their you know, the, their their thought and their language is being controlled by school boards that are infected by this ideology, this poisonous ideology. And then the wider the wider community, they also nobody's nobody dares say anything. Everybody's, you know, not really sure what's going on. So the control of language is crucial to what what has happened to these young people if we had been if we had all been af- allowed to speak freely from the beginning i do not believe anywhere near as num- as many young people would have been harmed and then i do think part of it i don't there's obviously there has been cowardice on the part of the wider public you know that we many of us just stood by and allowed it to happen to these kids but then if you look at it like the average teacher or the average person they have you know you have bills to pay you have a mortgage you have a family like if these people will go after you they'll go after your job they'll financially ruin you if you say the wrong pronouns or if you use the wrong language you can kind of understand why everybody was so afraid to speak up so when when all this is over we of course are going to be blaming the medical professionals but we must not forget the role that the the trans activists played in 
in silencing all questions and silencing dissent and viciously attacking anyone who raised the alarm, that the, definitely the control of language is huge. Yeah, we went from, you know, you got to be politically correct. You got to be PC to if that's a microaggression, whatever that side look was to hate speech. You just said something I don't like. You're canceled. So, yeah, we definitely have moved down that 1984 route. And the subversion of speech, the changing of language is the means by which they've been able to really like castrate in a way the general public, particularly, you know, like you said, we have a large you know, portion of the population, which somewhere between being apathetic or lazy or maybe cowardice to speak out, have actually become, in a sense, verbally neutered. And like they can't even, you know, collect the words together to articulate without offending somebody of what's going on. So we're very far removed from that common sense shared understanding. Th- that kind of brings me to. My next question, which is where does or did, you know, I'm looking at it as like this dying monster right now, but where does uh, WPATH get its authority? (laughs) They're self-appointed, to be honest. I would say they they self-identify as a world-leading healthcare group. It's really... I think it's a remarkable stunt that they pulled, basically. So in the early days, you know, they used to be called the Harry Benjamin International Gender Dysphoria Association, HIBIGDA. The the HIBIGDA formed in 1978 and, you know, they're all doing their very obscure science, whatever, research. And then around like the turn of the century, around the year, the late 90s, early 2000s, that's when the modern trans rights movement gets started, sort of running parallel with with Habigda. And then a whole bunch of activists join Habigda. And then from that point on, the two sort of evolve together, the the trans rights movement and Habigda, WPATH. But then in 2007, they they go for the full rebrand. They call themselves the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, which honestly, it's just basically they have just self-identified as a world-leading healthcare group. They still don't have any science. They're still, they're basically at this point, very much a political activist group with no science whatsoever. But from the moment that they self-identify as this world-leading group, everybody looks to them. So they, and they, you know, they publish these standards of care, they influence all the standards of care and all the guidelines of all the major medical associations. And so at the center of it all is an empty shell where there is no science whatsoever. But because, you know, WPATH influenced the endocrine society guidelines and then the endocrine society guidelines influence WPATH guidelines. And then from there, it just sort of balloons out into this complex web of medical associations endorsing each other. They're just saying, okay, well, WPATH says this, so we're going to say it too. And then WPATH comes along and WPATH says, well, all of these medical associations, they say that it's good, so it must be good. And they're all endorsing each other, but in the middle, there, there really is an empty shell. There's nothing in there at all. So it's basically... They just appointed themselves as the authority. And you can see it. You can see how pointless they are. You can see how obsolete the organization is. If you look to Europe, so in North America, all of the major medical associations do indeed endorse WPATH's style of gender affirming care. But look to Europe, they've abandoned WPATH. I don't think there's any nation in Europe still looking to WPATH. Maybe the maybe one or two, but the Sweden and Finland and England, Norway, Denmark, Belgium, France, they they're all they've all just abandoned WPATH. They've looked at the evidence. They're now being guided by evidence. They're not being guided by, you know, fake science like we are in North America. And they're doing just fine. Then then the 
people, the trans identified people in Europe are going to still receive healthcare, but it's going to be healthcare based on actual science rather than just this politically motivated pseudoscience that we have here. Yeah. I think it's really concerning that you can just kind of put, you know, the national association or whatever on whatever club and all of a sudden you're it because, you know, you named yourself the most general title you can. And, and yet, they're still peddling around their ideology as they get kicked out of one town, one country after another. And it kind of makes you wonder, okay, you know, what is the real ambition? Like what's the real end goal or the hope of this organization? Like vending machine transitions, like we want to on demand instantly you walk in, no regrets. It's done in, inpatient outpatient. So, Because this is a really, you know, upsetting subject to be involved in. So what is the motivation for the leadership on the board of this organization to keep doing this? Obviously, they're getting a paycheck and somebody's paying that. Have you seen any indications based on financing that could indicate whose interests this organization is mostly serving? I ha- I did not dig into the follow the money side of it. I don't know if you've heard of the journalist Jennifer Billick. She does the 11th hour blog. She's done so much digging into the finance aspect of this, who's funding it all. I personally, from spending so long immersed in the world of WPATH, I am convinced that this this is being driven by ideology. Definitely, of course, there there are there's a financial incentive and there are people in there who are in there because they're making a whole ton of money. But I think primarily what drives this is ideology. I think it is the people the inside WPATH right now are absolutely convinced that they are the good guys, that they are on this quest to make the world a better place, to provide necessary, life-saving healthcare to a vulnerable, discriminated group in society. I do not believe that they're in there most of them anyway, because they're making money. I think it makes them more dangerous that they're motivated by this quest, this this sort of self-righteous quest, because they therefore absolutely cannot see the harm at that point. If you are if you are convinced that hormones and surgeries is the only answer to gender-related distress, and if you are convinced that it is a human right for a person to modify their body in whatever way they choose to align with their inner gender essence, then you're not going to be able to see the truth. You're not, like, if you're convinced that restricting access to these, this treatment protocol is a human rights violation. It's transphobia, it's discrimination. You're not going to be able to see like the the f- almost 400 page CAS report that came out last week or the week before. This was a, an independent review of the youth gender service in England. This was a very meticulously researched document chock full of you know the findings of systematic reviews of the evidence and everything and the way it has been received by WPATH and those the supporters of gender affirming care is they're just they're accusing this independent review of being politically motivated they're suggesting that it's it's motivated by transphobia and discrimination and bigotry and that is I don't think that's them panicking because they think they're going to lose their paycheck. I think that is actually coming from a genuine place where they exist in a very insulated bubble of ideology. It's political activism. 
anything that calls into question the treatment protocol that they that they that they endorse must be because of transphobia it must be because of bigotry and so it makes them much more dangerous i think i totally agree with you you know like ideology will take you to like that guy who just lit himself on fire you know in front of the the trump trial it'll take you to those levels you know paychecks not so much like you know you'll sell out on somebody you'll you know there's you'll do a lot less for money than you will i think you know for a cause you really believe in and on one hand i would hope that everybody involved in that cause genuinely does have the you know the general welfare of the public in mind and at heart and is there true intention to do good you know and obviously both sides of the argument can't be right even though both sides i think feel like you know they're trying to do what's best for everybody but on the other hand you know we do have i think that that creeping awareness that something isn't all right with the procedures as they've been going and it's kind of like this confirmation bias you you've been you know pointing to it's like once you've made the decision you've gone the route hey you can't go back now to say you made a mistake would be to admit a very terrible thing so you know and so part of my question was actually aimed at you know the hopes that you know somebody's conscience couldn't be so seared that seeing all of this they would still pursue it as this quest that like you know they need to you know at some point it's like ah oh, wait maybe this quest isn't a, a worthy quest maybe we need to settle down here question here based on your findings in the reporting what area do you think we need to put in a microscope over and look into a little bit deeper i would say it should be the detrimental side effects of cross-sex hormones. So when we talked earlier about the liver tumors that these the this case of a young girl, 16-year-old girl with liver tumors, that that's only one aspect of it. There's a really distressing part of the report for me to write was the discussions about the detrimental effects of testosterone on the female reproductive system. So WPATH, the way WPATH speaks to the public and the way that they present gender affirming care to the public, they will present it as medically necessary, life saving care that improves the health and well being of transgender people. And there's very little discussion about how harsh testosterone is, how, how devastating the side effects of testosterone can be for the female body. And so in the files, there's a discussion about, it's a 17-year-old girl, she's on, been on testosterone for a few years, and I think she showed up in the emergency room. She has pelvic inflammatory disease, she has vaginal and uterine atrophy, there's bleeding, there's cracking, there's discharge. And the the person who posts about her says, you know, she has the discharge that we commonly see as a result. Like this is a common side effect of testosterone that I don't think, well, I think part of the reason we're not talking about it is because we do tend to shy away from unpleasant conversations. This is, can you imagine CNN reporting on a girl ending up in the emergency room with vaginal atrophy and bleeding and pain? These are just, these are just symptoms and disorders that we don't like to talk about in public. But because we're not talking about it and because gender affirming care is being sold to young people, to young women and teenage girls as being, you know, this wonderful treatment pathway. If you get on the testosterone, you're going to feel really great and it's going to solve all your problems. Because we shy away from talking about the really, really devastating side effects, these young women are consenting to a treatment pathway that they they do not understand. And it's actually, I'm talking only about women, probably because I am a woman and I understand the, the female biology, but the men, those are those are common in there. Like there's a there's men on estrogen 
who are they're experiencing painful erections and one you know somebody shows up well what should i do about this and nobody really knows what to do it's just a side effect of being on estrogen and someone shows up and says that she's seen patients having erections that feel like broken glass now i don't have that piece of anatomy but i'm going to assume that that's not that pleasant and so we've got to we've just got to talk about the reality of all of it basically i think when you when you read these files when you spend a lot of time looking at the the conversations that these people are having i think we've got to just talk about the reality of the treatment pathway and i also think that i don't know if you want to go in this direction but i also think we have got to talk about autogynephilia we have got to we have got to talk about basically we've just got to talk about we've got to bring the conversation around to w- what is driving the people who want to transition because right now it's just they are transgender people and a whole bunch of very disparate groups fall under the umbrella of transgender and they've all got different developmental pathways some are coming at it because they're homosexual and they have internalized homophobia and they don't want to be gay and they've experienced difficult difficulties in their life for being gender nonconforming and they've come to the conclusion that transition is the answer and then you've got the social contagion kids who are just the kids who are not thriving and they're growing up in this mad moment in human history where they're being told that basically they're all of their pubertal woes are assigned their transgender and they're latching onto this idea but then you've got a really strong cohort a large group of men who are seeking medical transition for erotic purposes these are men who are aroused by the image of themselves as women and they are seeking medical transition for that purpose so another thing we have to do is we have to separate all the groups of people who are falling under the trans umbrella and then we can help each group individually specific to their own very individual needs wow yeah that's that's really powerful so i'm kind of can you say that again? Auto autogynophilia. Auto gynophilia. Yes. It it literally means love of oneself as a woman. Okay. And so it's a paraphilia that it is a man who is aroused by the image of himself as a woman he can he can be aroused by the the fantasy of having female bodily functions so he might find menstruation the thought of him himself menstruating to be arousing the thought of childbirth to be arousing a very important factor of it is breastfeeding a baby can be arousing if you if you think about that and you take that to its logical conclusion the the, the men the the, the trans identified men the men who think they're women who are breastfeeding their babies we, because that's actually encouraged now if they are autogynephilic they they they're living out their sexual fantasy and the newborn baby is being used as a prop you can have a debate there's a debate to be had about whether or not that is safe for the baby whether that's acceptable behavior i i lean towards no absolutely not there's even talk in the wpath files about men who want to breastfeed there's one honestly one of the most outrageous files <laughs> and I think we may have even found the line for WPATH because nobody responds to this person. There's someone who shows up and they say, I've got a assigned male, this is their language, assigned male at birth, trans feminine client who wishes to take Viagra while breastfeeding. And I can't find any sort of drug interactions, whether whether that's safe for this trans feminine male 
to ta- take Viagra while breastfeeding? And nobody replies. I think that might even be the line for W Path of like, whoa, we're not even not even going to talk about that. But when you think about that, this W Path member, instead of if you've got a man in your clinic who wants to take Viagra while he's breastfeeding a baby, what you need to do is call child protection services. You don't need to go into your forum and ask the forum if Viagra is safe while breastfeeding, right? So we've got to talk about autogynophilia. I think it's like crucial to the entire debate. And again, it's because we're not comfortable talking about fetishes. I get it. Like I'm not, I know far too much about men and their fetishes at this point in my life, but we as a society don't really know how to talk about this. And then of course we're forbidden. The the trans rights activists, they for, they, they deny the existence of autogynophilia and the reason for that is very obvious. And there's a quote by Ray Blanchard. So Ray Blanchard is the sexologist who came up with the theory of autogynophilia in 1989. And he explains it perfectly why they forbid us from talking about it. And he says, it's one thing for a man to show up at work one day dressed as a woman and for him to say, I'm coming to terms with the fact that I've always been a woman on the inside. And it's quite another for him to show up and say, I've moved on from just masturbating wearing women's clothing to wearing them all the time. Which one is more socially acceptable? Of course, the modern trans rights movement does not want anyone to know that these men have spent years, maybe decades, masturbating, wearing women's clothing, and now they are wearing them full time and living as a woman. It's much more palatable, more sanitized for it to be an inner woman essence. Yeah. No, for real. It's, you know, nothing surprises me anymore, you know, when it comes to fetishes, I guess, you know, it's just like something can happen. Somebody's can be into it. And, and, but it is very strange to have, to add into this auto ganophilia category, the arousal while breastfeeding one's child and then you add, like in the that example you just gave of that patient who also wanted to take their Viagra, which we know goes right into the breast milk. And we Does don't it? Need, we don't even know. We don't Never need to tested, top up on we? Viagra. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, what a weird situation we're in. You know, when we're like, oh, they're like half transitioned, you know, and then all these weird situations come up. What do you think in your findings is probably the worst violation of medical responsibilities that maybe you saw? For me, no question. It is, it's right towards the end of the report. I talk about it in the files. There are conversations about non-binary surgeries is the sort of general term. So This is, everybody thinks non-binary is, you know, silly blue hair and and they, them pronouns, but there's a really dark side to it and that's the surgical side. So in the files, there are very, very strange conversations about these these non-binary surgeries. There's surgeons in there and there's one, you know, he's talking about how He's really comfortable doing nullification surgeries. So that's, you know, the person who believes themselves to be neither male nor female and they want a smooth, sexless body like a, a Barbie doll or something, like a Ken doll. Or no, no outward sign of sexual characteristics at all, just a smooth body. Then there's the opposite of that, which is the people who identify as both male and female and they want both sets of genitals. That's called bigenital surgery. So as we talked about it before, if when a man wants a surgically created vagina, they just invert his penis. But if he's a non-binary person, both male and female, he wants both sets, they'll they'll keep he he wants to keep his penis and then have a surgically created pseudo vagina made out of a part of his colon. So that's your bigenital surgery. Or on the other side, it would be the woman who wants an appendage made out of her forearm 
sewn onto her groin, but she wants to keep her vagina because she's both male and female. And then, you know, slightly less egregious violation of the Hippocratic Oath is like this same surgeon will perform mastectomies with customized scars and stuff like that. We're talking the most, it's just extreme body modification with absolutely no medical justification whatsoever. And it's not even, you see, at least with the the sort of standard sex reassignment, there was a psychiatric disorder, gender dysphoria, real distress, and it was a misguided attempt to alleviate that distress. But now that we have plunged into the realm of the non-binary surgeries, this is not, this is not treating gender dysphoria or anything like that. This is, I think, honestly, it's the demonic union of queer theory and surgery. It is, you know, queer theory is all about breaking down the gender binary and smashing the norms and everything. It's that in the operating theater. And you really, truly at this point can't call it experimental because in a medical experiment, somebody cares about which technique is better, which outcome is better, or should we be doing it this way or this way? These surgeons are just, it's the Wild West. They've they have abandoned anything that resembles the Hippocratic Oath, and they are just creating whatever the person wants. I mean, I don't know if you've heard about this. This is, we in Canada are the cautionary tale of what happens if you follow WPATH, you do not question them, and you, all of your health authorities look to WPATH for guidance because we have... There's a man in Ontario who, one of these men who thinks he's both male and female, he wants his colon vagina, but he wants to keep his penis. So he applied to our provincial, we have, you know, our health insurance is covered by provincial health plans. He applied for this to the surgery to be done and the health plan said, no, we're not doing that. So then he appealed and his appeal, the basis of his appeal was Forcing a non-binary person to go through binary surgery is a form of conversion therapy under our conversion therapy ban. And remarkably, the appeal board ruled in his favor and then quoted WPATH all the way through. They quoted, WPATH has a whole chapter about non-binary surgeries in its standards of care version eight that came out in 2022. And it, it, talks about these, you know, phallus preserving vaginoplasties and all the rest of it. And the 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 ruling in Ontario quoted, you know, WPATH about these individually customized bodies and how this is medically necessary care. So then the health plan appealed the appeal decision. They said we're still not paying for it. We we're, we're appealing it. And then he appealed that and he just won again. Last week he just won. So now the Ontario taxpayer will not only be paying for his colon vagina alongside his penis, we will also be paying for him to go down to Texas to the notorious Crane Center. It's a surgical center where they perform these absolutely horrific surgeries. We'll be paying for him to go and have his his colon vagina created in Texas. Wow. You know, there was this episode of South Park some time ago. You already know which one. Yeah, the and dolphin? Are, yeah, the guy. I want to be a dolphin. So they put a fin on him, and he's got, like, all this human skin. Looks all, like, human centipede type, you know, like, Frankenstein horror movie saw thing. And then the one guy is like, I want to be a tall black basketball player. So they made him black they broke his legs and then they stretched out his kneecaps and to make him tall and man it is so insane absolutely insane what people are doing and i you know that again that's fine to me it's almost as fine as like fine you want to go do body modification or get whatever i mean to me it would be like you just ruined your life but you know everybody's on their own little life path and that's whatever but you know the problem is when you're presenting these options to kids and then they embark on this and, you know, 
granted, we can't say much when it comes to adults. You know, the fact that we're at a place of where the technology's there, where people have that desire to sort of do that, you know, we might not agree with it, but uh, definitely the hard part is how do you keep this, what the adults are doing from influencing kids? And obviously we've set up an environment that welcomes prospective children into this way of life. So I I have to say though I don't I don't technically agree. I guess I have again the more hardline approach that I don't think we should be offering this to adults. I just think, you know, if you like what <laughs> this whole adults can do whatever they want. There's such a thing as medical ethics. Doctors take an oath to first do no harm, and therefore they should not be creating second sets of genitals or m m making, you know, stripping the forearm and sewing an appendage onto a woman's groin. I just think there is such thing as medical ethics. And just as I would not support if a consenting adult wanted to have a transorbital lobotomy, if he wanted to have ice pick shoved through his eye socket and fully consented and understood what was going to happen, I would not support that because that's the a gross violation of medical ethics. I don't think that if somebody identifies as blind, a surgeon should blind them. I think there are there has to be a limit to what these surgeons they they go through a lot of training. What they should not be using their hard won skills to destroy healthy bodies in this way. And so, no, I think there have to be limits on a, a person's autonomy and surgeons must remember their oath. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. I mean, the fact is like with most people, my line is m much further, closer to center than, you know, having a thin installed on your back again that's from a tv show not in real life but same you know we're talking about multiple genitalia making yourself into a hermaphrodite or whatever yeah i definitely draw that line way before that point and yeah i think the argument especially with what we do at gaze against groomers is you know at least our mission focused angle is that okay we're going to focus on what's affecting the kids and and the official organizational position is you know we're not digging into what adults are doing so much but personally as individuals we all have our own perspectives and of what's right and wrong in the first place and so i would definitely say that i personally agree with you on all of that i mean it is inhuman ultimately and I think that's what a lot of people are going for. You know, they feel disassociated. They feel they're non-binary. I'm not of the species. I'm a toaster oven or whatever their gender identity is. And so, you know, what's next? Are we going to start like welding iron onto you and polishing up a nice toaster sur surface? Because you're a 1950s toaster after all. And it's just, it's absolutely crazy, but it's happening. It's dangerous, it's unhealthy, and and the effects of it are definitely adding to the whole social contagion aspect of showing people that they can literally become all these things that are just not what they were born to be. We at Gays Against Groomers don't believe that kids are born in the wrong body, for instance. You know, and it goes right back to what we we're talking about. This is like you know, this is psychosomatic. This is a, a mental condition. It's a mental health condition, the gender dysphoria and body dysmorphia. And so it should be handled through the maturation of one's psychology, through personal development and that sort of thing, through maybe counseling or therapy, things like that. And yeah, it's just, it's terrible. It's ever being like really offered up as a treatment. Okay. They, they call it a treatment for you know, these conditions. So it's definitely not a cure. Anything else you'd like to say? We're getting ready to wrap up here in about maybe 10 minutes. Is there anything? On the subject of kids, I think we haven't really gone there yet, but I think the most important conversation we've got to have as far as kids are concerned is 
we have got to rid society completely of the concept of the transgender child. As you just said, no child is born in the wrong body. Well, beyond that, the gender identity. We've got to rid society of this, this made up concept of the gender identity. But we really absolutely must bring reality back to childhood. And we need to make sure that no child is ever taught that it's possible to be transgender. We've got to in in schools, we've got to in the messaging that kids receive in in books and television shows, we have absolutely got to abolish the most dangerous concept in existence. And that is the concept of the transgender child. And I think in places where puberty blockers are being banned, there's going to be a bit of a difficult shift because as long as the concept of the transgender child exists, there will be children, there will be parents who apply that label to their child. And there will also, there will also be older children, like the 9, 10, 11 year olds, who will apply that label to themselves. And any of those kids then are going to need puberty blockers. They're going to think that they need it because they think they are transgender and they think they need this medical pathway. So along with banning puberty blockers, which we all must do, and that is coming close for, for most nations, I would say now, we have got to absolutely rid all of society of this concept of the transgender child and go back to just allowing kids to experiment. Let let kids be kids. Let them play with whatever toys they like. If he's a boy and he likes Barbies and sparkles, let him be a boy who likes Barbies and sparkles. And get rid of this really regressive, dangerous idea that we let take root. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think in terms of ridding society of this ideology? You know, we have a lot of momentum already in that direction, which has put most of the country at sufferance at one point or another, whether it's like being bombarded with propaganda or getting screamed at from somebody calling you a homophobe, transphobe for something that I didn't do. They really saturated deep into the roots of society, this ideology, the propaganda, the indoctrination, and, and these people are being weaponized. They're weaponized against all of traditional society, all of everything that makes America a fabulous place to be and free. And it's, and it's being weaponized in terms of, you know, very communist type behavior, Maoist Marxist type mentality of anarchy and destruction of the establishment and establishment of any norms. And just really like taking us into some post-apocalyptic world and it almost seems like the momentum is so great. It's like we got to figure out how to edge ourselves, you know, to shimmy ourselves in between where America hasn't complete, completely been rotted out from, you know, this opposing force, this frying pan run. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me. I'm in Canada, so it's it's hard for me to really... I guess on a on a general sense, every nation on earth needs to start. We need to unpick everything that they've done. So they've got decades on us. This was a, a rights movement, a very strong movement that did all the groundwork behind the scenes and then just sort of ready-made thrust this whole system, this whole ideological belief system onto us and forbid us from questioning it. So We've got to unpick everything they've done. It really, I say we've got to get rid of the concept of the transgender child, but what we've got to get rid of is the concept of the gender identity. And so everywhere that that exists, it needs to be removed. And so that means every school board needs to look at its materials and yank out any mention of gender identities because it's not true and it's not real and children deserve a childhood grounded in truth. But then wherever you've got gender identity written into policy or law, you've got to you've got to pull it out because it's not real and it doesn't exist and it just muddles everything up, you know. Laws we we like you can only protect biological sex 
or gender identity. It's an either or situation. You absolutely in law cannot protect both because if your if your spaces are designated for people of a certain sex, male or female, then you cannot then also separate spaces based on gender identities. So prioritizing reality in law and public policy is vital. Just prioritize biological sex. I think there's still a way. I still remain hopeful that there's a way because there are a lot of people who have made this decision for themselves. They have gone down this medical pathway. And whether you agree with it or not, that they have gone down this medical pathway, they have and they exist. And we need to find a way to accommodate people who identify as transgender. But we just also absolutely need to be able to live in reality, describe reality, insist upon biological sex and reality being the basis for all law and public policy, while at the same time ensuring that children get an education that is grounded in truth and doesn't contain any of these absurd ideas about you know, children born in the wrong body, female brains in male bodies, all of this nonsense that has no grounding in truth. But it's just, I, I see if you look to England, I don't know if you follow what's going on in my home country, I feel that they are they're getting there. They're almost there. Like somebody, they, a whole group of people just signed a letter calling for a national inquiry into the harm of gender identity ideology in society. Basically, like look at every layer of society, look at the policies and the laws that, that were influenced by trans activism, modern trans activism, and investigate how it happened, why it happened, and how can we fix it. That's basically what we have to do. It's an enormous task, but we have to do it. Yeah, that has to be done. And I don't think people want to see the truth. Uh, the advocates, the people pushing for this, they don't want to discover what is under the surface of a society that has fully adopted these kinds of policies and principles and and ethics and the whole thing that goes with it. So one thing I like that you said is, you know, this is a ready-made ideology. And it really did just kind of pop onto the scene, you know, fully baked handbook, you know, manual in hand. And here are the, the structures and the policies and, you know, all of this. And I think it makes me think of the whole question of like, where did this whole ideology originate? And so I often ask myself, did it come out of society because you know people were just like i got to be trans and i'm gonna speak my truth and everybody stand up with me or is this coming top down through the influence of corporations in the form of propaganda and indoctrination in order to popularize a mental illness to destabilize the family and humanity and etc it's very complicated i think there's a few forces at play but if you want to, you can actually, what I believe you can read the blueprint of modern trans activism. And that is a book that was written in, I believe, well, published, I think, in 1994. And it's called The Apartheid of Sex. And it's written by Martine Rothblatt. Now, Rothblatt is a, well, I will say, I will say, I, I, can't say for sure, but I'm assuming Rothblatt is an autogynophilic man. And uh, so he's a man who thinks he's a woman, identifies as a woman, and he's also a very wealthy, powerful man. And I think in, in the 1990s, well, no, probably the late 1980s, a group of very powerful, wealthy, trans-identified men, and a couple of women, to be honest, they, I think they saw the end of the gay rights movement. They saw it in the future. They, they saw that the, the battle for gay rights would be won sometime in the future, and they wanted to be ready for trans rights. They decided that trans rights was going to come next, and they wanted to be ready for that. And so they do all of this behind the scenes. But if you read Rothblatt's book in, that was published in 1994, 
honestly, it's basically modern transactivism. It is this idea that everyone possesses a gender identity and it is your gender identity that makes you a man or a woman, boy or a girl. Everyone should have the right to modify their body medically in whatever way they choose to align themselves with their gender identity. There's talk about step separating spaces, so like any you you can access spaces based on your gender identity. There's talk about there's even a weird part where Rothblatt sort of he breaks down all of these little personality traits and gender traits into colors there's like this rainbow everything which is basically like all the crazy flags and stuff that we have now and it's just he pulled it he almost pulled it all off i mean they really what they did then is they they at the same time as rothblatt's book there was something called the international bill of trend of gender rights or something like that which is basically the same thing. It is like Rothblatt's book. It's the gender identity and the separating spaces. And I think you've got male lesbians mentioned as well. Like sexuality is now defined by gender identity rather than reality. And then that happens in the 90s. But then in the year 2007, there's another pivotal moment where they take all of these crazy ideas and there's a meeting in Jogjakarta, the city of Jogjakarta in Indonesia, and it's a bunch of human rights lawyers, trans activists, transgender people. They all get together and they have this meeting, actually, I think it was 2006, and they draw up the Jogjakarta principles, which is, again, modern trans activism. Now it's, it's got, it's official. There are, there are, I can't remember how many principles, maybe 12 principles. And it's all about, again, it's about the right to self-identify as a man or a woman, the right to modify your body based upon your internal gender identity. And But again, remember, none of us knew this was happening. This is not a grassroots organization where they're standing on the streets with their placards and they're, they're calling for trans rights and demanding trans rights. No, they're a bunch of very wealthy, powerful people doing all of these things behind the scene, laying out all of their demands and all of their principles, and it all looks very legitimate. So that's 2006. And then you don't start to see it really appear. I think I think Ontario, where I live, may have been the first province or first sort of place to adopt the Joe Jakarta principles. We put gender identity into law into our human rights code in 2012 and then from basically around 20 like early 2010s that's when you really start to see the 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 movement get going and all of the groundwork that they've laid they've set it all out they're all really powerful people they've set it all out and then it suddenly starts to appear in laws and in in human rights codes all over the world and then we're off and from that point on, they also, it's a very coordinated effort where the the schools, then they all start teaching about these non-existent gender stoles. They start teaching children that they can be born in the wrong body. That all happens at the same time. And then the social contagion is triggered and off we go. The medical world just at the exact same moment happens to lose its mind, forget the Hippocratic Oath, abandon science, abandon evidence, and just unleash the puberty blockers experiment at the very same moment that the social contagion was triggered by the modern trans rights movement and its its messaging. It was really, truly the perfect storm. Wow. So yeah, that is definitely an example of a concerted planned effort to foist the trans ideology the world and i think i think the motivation again i don't think anyone set out to trigger a social contagion and suck a whole bunch of kids into this and i don't think even it was financial i don't think it was let's make a whole lot of money on gender medicine i think it was a bunch of a small tiny number of very powerful very influential trans identified people mostly men who want to be women and they had the power and saw the opportunity to create a world in which they could be women okay so they thrust this ideology onto all of us and it it 
gives them they then can be women they can live out their fantasy they can be what they so desire and they had the power to do it but the collateral damage is all of the innocent young victims who as a result of the messaging and the powerful political movement that these this tiny number of people set in motion all of these young social contagion kids are now you know missing body parts missing their fertility lacking the ability to form intimate relationships and that's just that wasn't that was a that was collateral damage that was an unintended consequence of a political movement well you seem to know a lot about the trans illuminati <laughs> let me ask you <laughs> no but that's what that makes me think of the the transgender illuminati and it makes me wonder though how kids or the youth wouldn't play into those sorts of ambitions. When we look into the work of Alfred McKinsey or John Money, and we see some of that queer theory and the early childhood sexuality that was studied, like, you know, they were doing stuff to infants, you know, to create orgasms and, and measuring that sort of thing. So it seems like the people who are very much tied into those sorts of ideologies and the, the founding of qu queer theory, and now we have really like taking a step forward with the maps. We have a whole demographic of people that are coming out and really like even trying to, you know, cover themselves under the LGBTQIA plus flag and. It just seems like there's just so many elements. Talk about a perfect storm. There are many elements. You see, I separate I separate money, Kinsey. Well, money and Kinsey. But Harry Benjamin was one of though one of the three pivotal figures as well. And obviously Harry Benjamin was crucial in the whole gender thing. But I think the targeting of kids in in this particular like the modern trans rights movement to me is based upon gender identity ideology. Queer theory is almost like that was going on at the same time, running parallel, but the two don't actually, in my mind, mesh very well together because, you know, queer theory is all about breaking down the gender binary and breaking every, smashing everything that's normal, basically. And I don't even know what they think comes after that. It's we're all just weird with colorful hair and no family. It doesn't seem very beneficial to anyone. But to me, gender identity ideology is the opposite. They rigidly enfo enforce the gender binary. It's like, you know, you've got male and female rigid stereotypes. If you don't fit into those rigid stereotypes, then you must be a member of the opposite sex. So queer theory and gender identity ideology don't go very well in my mind together. They're sort of in direct contradiction with each other. But the the reason I think that gender identity ideology and the modern trans rights movement, it absolutely, I don't think it deliberately went after kids, but it had to go after kids in the sense that it's based upon the idea that a man is a woman because he possesses a female gender identity. And if he possesses a female gender identity, then that means everyone has to possess a gender identity, right? Like sometime in the 2010s, all of a sudden, we were all told that we possess a gender identity. We'd never even heard of it before. It's, it's, there's no proof that it even exists, but we were not only told that we all possess a gender identity, but we were then it was written into law that suddenly the law is protecting this this innate gender essence that resides within us all but but that's why they ended up whether they did, did it deliberately or not i don't know that's why they ended up going after kids is because if everyone possesses a gender identity then children must possess a gender identity because everyone has one and if children possess gender identities, then there must be such a thing as a transgender child. There have to be children who they their gender identity is mismatched. It doesn't it doesn't match the body that they were born in. And I think there's another motivation for them 
which going back to autogynephilia that we talked about is because they do not want to face the reality of their paraphilia, of their fetish, these men, it's if they can point to the fact that there's a transgender child, then that means it can't be a fetish because children aren't sexual. So it's like if if transgender children exist, then it it, it diverts attention away from what is truly motivating many of these men to identify as women, and that's a sexual fetish. So I can't really say whether I think they deliberately... Queer theory is something else entirely. Queer theory, for some reason, like it's based upon smashing everything normal, including childhood innocence and the family structure. So yeah, for sure, those guys are definitely targeting children and they're definitely... There's there's some very questionable motives over there, but gender identity ideology it just it because it they 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 did a whole rewrite of what it means to be human. All of a sudden, what makes you a man, woman, boy, or girl is not your body; it's an innate gender soul that resides within you. And when they did that, there was always going to be collateral damage of children who interpreted their lives through the lens of gender identity ideology and believed themselves to be transgender. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I do see, I do see these things coming together, though they weren't formed together. You know, you're just discussing this person who went in for surgery so that they could have both genitalia, you know, like a hermaphrodite, late in life hermaphrodite. And then you tie that in with that autogynophilia and you tie that in with, you know, the autism and the, who are the propensity of, the victims of this sort of thing. It just seems like, yeah, they may have all grown up separately, but now they're growing together into a knot. A yeah, they're very much, I mean, I see the non-binary surgeries truly as being queer theory in the operating theater, I think. So it, within WPATH now, yes, they've they've meshed together gender identity ideology and queer theory and it's all together in one dangerous soup of you know hormones and surgeries and trans activism and yeah the, this is i mean i say it in the report and i and i've said it many times that i do think this is the worst medical scandal in the history of modern medicine we've had lots we've had plenty of scandals but i don't think that we've had one We've had a crime this egregious before, and I think it's going to take decades before we get to the point where we really understand the scale of this catastrophe. But I, I really think it's shaping up to be the worst crime the medical world has ever committed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is a travesty what's happening to these people's bodies to fix mental considerations. Who do you think, looking back at the records that you reviewed, was the worst offender? Are you are you naming names? Or is there is there a role that people that we need to watch within that organization based on these findings? We named only prominent WPATH members and surgeons because we figured all of the little minions inside there, all of the little therapists and whomever, like there's all sorts of the student researchers, there's all sorts of people in there. So we named only prominent members. I mean, Marcy Bowers is the president of WPATH. Marcy Bowers is the one, is the surgeon who has performed thousands of vaginoplasty surgeries over his career. He is himself a man who identifies as a woman. And he's all over the the files. And basically almost everything he says is quite appalling. And so he's in there talking about detransitioners and and just trivializing the the trauma and the negative like the 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 horror and the pain and the suffering of detransitioners he'll trivialize it and and suggest that he, there's one line in it where he actually says people have to own and take active responsibility for their decisions especially when they are irreversible medical decisions completely oblivious to the fact that it's not the young person's fault at all. They were probably very mentally ill, probably in a very vulnerable state. And it was a complete and utter failing on the part of 
every medical professional that they came into contact with. He's completely oblivious to the fact that all of the blame rests entirely upon the shoulders of these gender-affirming clinicians. And at the same time, straying from the files, Bowers, before he became WPATH president, there is a speech. It's a really interesting speech. It's called, it's basically the Be Bold speech. And it's from 2018. Bowers is at the WPATH annual conference. And I think he's talking to the Standards of Care Committee. So this would be they, they've just started, they're working on Standards of Care version 8, the one that came out in 2022. And Bowers does this really sort of, you know, inspirational speech where he tells the committee members to be bold. He tells them, you know, the, to lower the age limits because, you know, adolescents need access to hormones and surgeries. And he says, you know, gatekey, he's talked to all of the, the transgender members of WPATH and they all think that so the mental health referral letters, that's unnecessary gatekeeping and it's transphobic. So basically what Bowers is doing in that in that speech is he's advising the those who are drawing up the guidelines that will be followed internationally by doctors all over the world he's advising the removal of safeguards, okay? Like he is basically saying safeguarding is transphobic, lower the age limit, make it easier to get access to drugs and surgeries because otherwise it's discrimination. And then four years later or five years later, when the victims, okay, because the, the WPATH basically campaigned to remove all safeguards, the guardrails are transphobic, let's remove all the guardrails, then a whole bunch of innocent young adolescents in terrible mental health, in terrible states of distress, they come stumbling along, they plunge into the abyss, their bodies are destroyed, they become the victims of, of these doctors who have abandoned all safeguarding, and then at the end of it, Bowers says, You've got to own and take active responsibility for your decisions, especially if it's a medical decision with lifelong consequences, completely obli oblivious to the fact that WPATH is the very reason that all of these kids got harmed because WPATH removed the safeguarding. Wow. Yeah. You know, it, that roundabout logic and that callousness to the, it, it really is a kind of gaslighting too. Like to suggest that kids are supposed to know as much about the effects of this one off surgery. They may be no few, if anybody who's ever gone through from the perspective of advanced modern state of the art technology and its studies and findings. I mean, it's just an absolute gaslight to expect somebody to know all of those liabilities when they go into this. It also makes me think of like, you probably saw that episode or that part of Blue's Clues where they had that whole transgender parade. I know. Unspeakable. I grew up on Blue's Clues. So I'm just like, I mean, this is like for infant TV. And you have, you know, the families of these different animals with all of their different trans identifying flags that set around them. And, you know, when we advertise medicine on TV, pharmaceuticals, you get a long list of all the side effects. You get told, ask your doctor about this and prepare for night sweats, for the shimmers and the shakes and the diarrhea, upset stomach, and you know this, that, and the other possible death. And then we get over again, back into Blue's Clues or back into pop culture, and we're having it promoted to us, this medical treatment for a for a mental disorder is being promoted without any warnings, without any discussions or anything like that, saying, parents, before your kids watch this, you should know it's going to be dealing with issues surrounding, you know, trans identification. And there's a lot of health complications that can come with pursuing this route. You should know this and talk to your kid about this. None of that happens. It's just insinuated into their life like it's just you're you're going to get a haircut except it's your penis this time. Yeah. Yeah, the the blues clues it, they they had a beaver with mastectomy scars, right? There's the the trans yeah. flag and there's a beaver with the mastectomy scars. You see, this is the this is they I think 
the makers of Blue's Clues, that particular episode, and all sort of kids' shows like it or the books that are promoting this to children, in their mind, what they're doing is, first and foremost, they believe that there is such a thing as a transgender child. And so because there's such a thing as a transgender child, these poor kids need to see themselves represented and then they will, you know, they won't feel so much stigma. Society will be more accepting of them and then they, their lives will be much easier. It's a representation. They need to see themselves represented. What the, what these people do not understand is that they, that is a vector for the social contagion that if you are you are planting the idea into very young vulnerable minds that having your healthy breasts removed is perfectly normal and healthy you are planting the idea into a vulnerable mind that going down that medical pathway is just a normal part of human existence and that's a type of person being trans is a type of person and when you put those ideas into the minds of young people who are still, they're still finding their way, they're still figuring out the world. They don't understand yet themselves, their sexuality, their identities, and how they fit into the world. And if you plan a dangerous idea like having a mastectomy is perfectly natural and healthy and let's wave a flag and celebrate it, you are absolutely guaranteed to suck a certain number of very vulnerable, always as well, the most vulnerable kids, the ones who are autistic, the ones who are struggling with mental health issues, the ones who maybe have experienced trauma or or even they're just coming to terms with their homosexual identity and they haven't yet they haven't yet figured that out. You're gonna suck all of those kids in. And they, you know, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I really do think that the makers of these TV shows and everything, I think their intentions probably for the most part are good. Maybe some, maybe some ill intent, but they just, they don't realize the, the knock on effect. They don't understand social contagion. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I never stop going on about social contagion. And I think if, if everybody understood, just how how contagious ideas, how contagious behaviors are, how contagious emotions are, then we would be a whole lot more careful about the type of idea that we put into children's shows. And, and this one, I think, is the most dangerous idea of all, this idea that modifying your body is a road to happiness, that we're selling it to kids who are just about, they're either just about to go through puberty or they're in puberty and they're in this terrible time. And then we sell them this idea that having body parts chopped off is the road to happiness. And of course, some of them are, are getting sucked into it. Yeah, they are. I, you know, I think about things like money motivations versus an agenda versus just good old fashioned, good intent, people trying to do what they believe and they know is right. And it seems that in this world, what is lifted up, what is allowed to expand, what is protected by government agencies and foisted and propagandized by the mainstream media tend to be the things that are aligned with the the globalists with the individuals who are you know pulling the strings when it comes to the larger picture governmentally within different industries and so i do ask myself when certain things are allowed to progress and proliferate under the the current watchful censoring eye of big brother that we have ever before us if uh, these things that are happening are then part of or willed as part of this agenda to create, you know, if nothing else, discord in the world or chaos in the world. And so it definitely seems like this condition and this so called treatment, which is not medicine, it has been weaponized toward the destruction, yes, of the gays. We're transing the gay away. We're changing the tomboys out of existence. And then you're also insinuating this mental condition through the social contagion of the media into 
the mines or fertile minefields of children to start picking up like these behaviors and these beliefs about themselves that they should never have to go through. And then, and then it gets more concrete as we, I'm sorry for going on and on. I guess I'm just trying to, you know, understand my thoughts about this because, you know, I want to trust the intentions of the people who are actually doing this, no matter how like crazy they're being. I want to trust that they are trying their best to do what's right. But at the same time, it makes you wonder why voices like, well, gays against groomers, as you know, is, is widely criticized. And, but then other sort of things like this seem like, well, the front people, maybe people who are very mission focused and genuine, they're being empowered by people who I think don't really care about that and are really looking towards the, the destruction at the end of that rainbow. What say you? Yeah, I'm not very I'm not very conspiratorial minded, I suppose. I I think maybe it's a weakness of mine that I always try to attribute the best of intentions to the people who are inflicting this upon us. I I really do perhaps there's workings behind the scenes that that I do not understand and there are people who think that for whatever reason, it would be very beneficial to completely break down all of society and have have all of these kids experimented on. But I really do think that even even those, well, actually, no, maybe the ones at the very beginning, maybe the ones who who set up like Rothblatt and and his gang of very powerful people, I don't think they had the best intentions. I don't think they were actually looking to improve society and make society a better and more inclusive environment. I think they literally just wanted to, uh, they wanted to create a world in which they could be women. They wanted to create a fictional world in which they could live out their fantasy and force everyone to go along with it. And that's what they did. So no, I don't think they had good intentions, but I do think the vast majority of their foot soldiers who thought they were just fighting gay rights 2.0, I think the vast majority of people definitely think they are helping when they are doing absolutely terrible, devastating harm. Who's behind the scenes though? It's not. I'm not very good at I'm not very good at imagining the the conspiracy side of it. Yeah, I'm sure whoever, you know, if there was some nefarious plot afoot, we'd never really know who it truly was anyway, like the man mm-hmm. behind the curtain. But just looking at patterns of what seems to be prospering and what is not allowed to prosper right now, it just seems very telling and very concerning that, you know, it's kind of like you, you were talking about earlier, like, you know, if we could just uproot, you know, the transgender matter you know, particularly from the kids' culture altogether, you know, out of society, then we will have like removed a real, you know, aberration of sorts. And so I kind of think though, like how deeply enmeshed though are the how deep are the roots of, for instance, the transgender issue. I mean, it's root it, its roots wrap around Nike, they wrap around Walmart, they wrap around every company that changes their flags you know, once a year for transgender awareness. It, you know, it wraps around this celebrity and in this type of music and don't listen to me or watch me if you're not a supporter of this. So it's a, it's a very, it's like a specter. It's like this octopus. And, you know, if it's to be pulled out, I think, you know, it's, you know, will cause a real shift in the substrate of what, you know, everything's built on. So, yeah, this is a, it's a real matter for our times. And, you know, wherever the strings are at, obviously WPATH pulled a lot of those strings, you know, and so you did a great work by uh, organizing all of this for us to understand and to begin to go through even deeper. And hopefully it leads to a change in policies, legislation, things like that. Before we get out of here, what would be some of the last things you'd like to see change as a result of these findings? I would really, I think, I would just like every single nation to 
abandon WPATH, N not just abandon WPATH, but honestly, publicly abandon WPATH. It's, it's not good enough to me that everybody just sort of quietly, oh, let's get rid of WPATH. This is with this group, get rid of them out of the references and the policies. I think I would just like everyone to understand that they've been duped. And I think it's really hard to admit that you've been duped as like nation, a national health authority or a government or, or a hospital, a gender clinic, whatever. And, and on a personal level, I think it's very hard to admit that you fell for something, that you were tricked into believe, believing something that wasn't true. But I think I would just like people to be able to face up to the fact that they were duped and it's and I don't blame them because WPATH really pulled a great stunt. It was a it was a very remarkable trick that they pulled. It was very convincing. So first of all, let's just all face up to the fact that we were lied to. We were duped. And then like just stop listening to these people. Just just like they can still exist. They can go and do their weird, you know, transactivism with surgery thing over there. And we just we can just shift back to science and evidence and improving the health and well-being of a very vulnerable cohort of people in society. Absolutely. All right. Well, I hope all the same things. Let me ask you, where can people find you and your social media? Mostly. Well, I'm only on social media. I'm only on Twitter X now, I suppose. And my handle is at underscore cry Mia River. Mia is M-I-A. Cry Mia River. Cry Mia River. Underscore cry Mia River. I love it. And then what's your, uh, the sub stack that you guys write for? Well, I work for Michael Schellenberger and his Substack is public. I haven't been, I've been working for his nonprofit environmental progress. That's, that's where I wrote the WPATH files report and that's where we, we released it on environmentalprogress.org, I think is the website. I think I'll be writing some stuff for Michael's Substack Public more in the coming months. So you can find me at either one of those. Okay. And I'll be speaking at Dissident Dialogues in a few weeks in New York. Oh, wonderful. Okay. And so people can find the W files just by like doing a Google search for it. Yes, you can. I have it as well. It's in my Twitter bio, but yeah, you can find it on a Google search. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mia, for all of your time today, all of your amazing insight. Yeah, you're very informed, and I appreciate everything that you've shared with us in your time today. So thank, thank you very you much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, this is the end of the show, guys. So if you have not, like, subscribe, follow. You can go to gazeagainstgroomers.com to donate. You can email podcast at gazeagainstgroomers.com if you want to communicate with us. So that's it. Have a great week. Thank you.